I'm Mark Archibald. I'm the uh, chair and former chief judge of, of the, this competition. And uh, we have Paul Johnson here who's the, the current chief judge. Before we start our little presentation, I would really like to say that uh, the three teams that have made their presentations, you did a super job, uh, covered a lot of the points we're going to talk about, actually. So uh, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do those presentations. They were a, a, a really a big help. So first, first tip is the outline. Uh, and uh, after many years of looking at, uh, at reports, uh, and, and I, uh, I've seen so many that uh, are not in the order that we prescribe. The outline for the design report is laid out in the rules. Uh, follow that, read the rules, and follow that outline. That's what the judges are looking for. You will get points deducted if you do not follow that, that uh, outline. Don't leave out any section. You're going to lose points if you leave out a section at the, at the very least. So address all of the material that's there. There's also a design event scoring rubric that's posted on the uh, ASME website. Uh, that is the rubric that the judges use. When you read that down, don't give up a point. Go down that list very carefully and say, okay, have I addressed this issue. And you'd be surprised how many teams might have done something and not documented in the report and the judges see it and say, oh, well, that, that's nice. That should have been in your report. So document it, make sure it's in there, and make sure you cover all the points. This, this page is your friend. And this page is my friend because this is what, what we follow when we read your report. So if we have to jump around and look all over the place to find certain things, there's some things in here that have a very high weight that are very easy for you to get. And then there are others that take a lot of work to get two, three, four points. Follow, if you follow this, and we can go, yep, 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 I see the results, I see you've done your analysis, this is, is the key to follow. And this changes every year. We change the requirements to fine tune and to give you new challenges. <coughs> Uh, design innovation. It's very important to do your background research. It's very appreciative for the teams here especially to put your report up on, on your website. That's terrific. There, a lot of things have been done before and we want to continue to evolve, evolve and refine the competition and get better and better. As you see that what happens year after year when uh, the successful teams leave a legacy. Uh, don't claim a great innovation that's not new. Uh, there's a lot of information uh, available to you, and worse yet, don't claim an innovation for an old idea that doesn't work. Don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Learn from your peers, learn from other, from other teams. And that point would not be in here if we don't see that. So mm -hmm. we, we have seen issues like that. So do your, do your homework. Your PDS, your product design specifications, as engineers you learn how to develop a product design specification. That's important, and we ask for that explicitly in the report. Uh, do your legwork to develop a good PDS. Um, the, uh, the, the PDS should include criteria that you will use to judge whether your vehicle is successful or not by, by your own criteria. They may incorporate, they may parallel our rule, rules, but we really want you to say, this is what our vehicle should do. The uh, metrics that you use should be quantifiable, so you can really determine, did you meet that goal or not? They should be measurable, um, and they should be meaningful. And I have an example here for speed. Uh, a lot of reports may say, oh, we want this to go X number of miles per hour. Well, on a human-powered vehicle, that really is a meaningless uh, criteria because there's so many variables. How hard are you pedaling? What are the environmental conditions? Uh, and so forth. So maybe you want to specify something like uh, a healthy male should be able to power the vehicle to 30 kilometers per hour, 12 seconds, level dry, asphalt from a dead stop with no headwind or tailwinds. It takes longer to say, but it really conveys what you want to do, and you can go out and measure that. You know, if you just say 30 miles an hour, you can go down a hill on almost anything, find a big enough hill, and you can meet it. And uh, in your reports, provide justification. Where do you come up with those numbers? Uh, you might want to take surveys, you know, uh, and uh, use, uh, for example, uh, uh, build a house of quality, uh, 
use, use the tools that are available to engineers uh, to, uh, to develop that. But have some rationale. Don't just say, oh, that sounds like a good number to me. We can't stress this enough. Understanding what your specifications are and what your requirements are are very important. As you look ahead to your engineering career, you're going to live this out every day. The company I work for, we make custom machines. A, a customer gives us a certain set of requirements. It's not all detailed out like we've shown here. We have to understand what the requirements are. We have to determine what the specifications are, review that with them. In this case, the judging team, we're your customers. You need to understand what those requirements are and, and then seek to follow them along with making goals for yourself. For the PDS, to the analysis, to experiment, you need to tie all those together. In your PDS, you say, this is what we want our vehicle to be able to do. In the analysis, you analyze the vehicle, and, and of course, this is an iterative process, so I'm simplifying it a bit. But you say, this is what we think it really will do. And then you do the experiment and do performance testing, and you say, this is what our vehicle actually did. And then you go back and you look at the analysis and you say, how did the analysis compare to the experiment? And how did both the analysis and the experimental results compare to your PDS, what you originally wanted to do? Tie, tie it back together. Close the loop. How many of you actually experienced what your model told you it was going to do in the race today? Did it do exactly what you did? Perfect. That's terrific. So you can model it on in SOLIDWORKS, you can analyze it, and you get exactly that. That's, that's very rare. Engineering is an iterative process. And what we try and do here, and especially uh, when we talk about the, the roll cage, that's a safety thing, but it's also an engineering thing. We want you to go from end to end in the engineering cycle, from concept development, to design, to analysis, to testing, and compare how did it work according to your goals. Technical writing. Uh, technical writing is an extremely important and an extremely difficult task to learn for, for many, uh, many of us. Uh, your report is a technical document. Uh, it should be written as a technical document. You need to write with precision. Use the words in the precise meaning that conveys what you wish to convey. Uh, you need to write with clarity. And you need to write concisely. Uh, we don't want fluff in the report. We don't want you to just put a lot of, of words in that do not convey a lot of meaning. Uh, we also sometimes get, uh, get reports that say, well, the team felt that we should put on X tires, for example. Uh, the judges really don't care how you feel about the vehicle. They want to know the engineering principles and practices that you use to design it and the techniques you use to analyze it and to evaluate it. So keep the report technical, keep it clear, use precise language. Be objective, be concise, be technical. Learn to be a good communicator. Why do we have you write a report? We want you to practice. This is something that you will do in your career. Uh, we don't need a lot of verbiage. A, a good graph or a table of results and a, a quick explanation of your interpretation, that's very good. You don't have to write long stories. Uh, but this is very important, and you can go a long ways in your career by being a good communicator. OK, how to pass the safety check the first try. Uh, on a, a list of top 20 tips, uh, we, uh, we may have to keep this a little bit short. But there are some things that, uh, that you can do. Uh, first off, uh, before you even really uh, begin, as you begin your design, think about what safety means to you. We have certain requirements in the competition for safety, but what, how do you interpret safety? Can you take it beyond that? You should be designing for safety, and we would like you to, to show us how you considered safety in your design, above and beyond simply showing that you, you met our requirements. Um, and, and the judges score based on, on what you tell them about the safety. Um, then, when it comes to actually passing the safety check, the first thing is make sure your vehicle actually can pass the, the dynamic safety events. Go out and do it. It's in the rules. Lay out a course just like we do here, uh, 100 feet in a straight line at low speed. 
Make sure you can do a, a turn, minimum 25 foot radius, and stop within uh, 20 feet from 15 miles per hour. Practice it. Uh, make sure you can do that. Beyond that, look at uh, some of the things that, that judges very often catch you on. Uh, sharp edges, uh, composite fairings that have untaped, uh, just cut edges that, that could be sharp and could hurt you. Open tube ends uh, are, can be quite a hazard in a collision. Uh, screws, uh, where you have uh, excess thread length protruding, uh, can be quite a hazard. Uh, your uh, safety harness needs to be securely attached to the frame. Occasionally we find uh, insecure attachments, a variety of, of ways that uh, people have done that in the past. It should be securely and firmly attached to the frame. The rollover protection system, uh, we got a couple of examples of the importance of that system uh, today. Uh, and I've seen that in, in previous years as well. Uh, so uh, pay attention to that and make sure that it is secure, make sure that it really will provide protection and that your head does not stick above your rollover protection system, something we have seen in the past and teams get penalized for that. So uh, pay attention to those. Safety is ultimately your responsibility. Think about it, look for hazards. How can this fail? How can someone get hurt? Don't confuse testing and analysis. This is one we, we uh, frequently get, uh, particularly from some, some new teams. Analysis are the engineering calculations that you do uh, to predict performance. Uh, they may include using uh, modern software tools such as uh, FEA, uh, CFD, and so forth. It may be a, a computer program you've written, a spreadsheet analysis. Could be hand calculations. Uh, but they are, are analytical calculations. Testing is experimental. You're actually doing something, measuring the result and collecting that data. You can do testing in the developmental stage uh, to help you with the design, to help you guide the design, test out a new concept before you apply it, uh, to optimize certain components of the design. You can do testing after the design is complete to evaluate the performance, and that's where we get back to comparing that with your analysis and PDS that we mentioned earlier. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, rollover protection system, analysis and testing. And uh, Paul mentioned earlier that uh, not only is that a safety requirement, it is also uh, viewed by the judges as being a, uh, an important part of the engineering challenge of designing a vehicle. How many of you found that designing successfully and analyzing and testing an RPS system was a challenge? Okay. Usually, usually it is. Usually it is. Uh, it can be tough. Uh, and we want to see how, how well you can do that. Apply the, the loads per the rules. If you're doing an analysis, Pay attention to how the loads, uh, how your, your uh, structure is constrained. Uh, if you did uh, go inverted, what's the loads? If you're in a crash situation, you've got inertial loads. The biggest mass on the, uh, in the vehicle is what? The rider. And how are, is the rider connected to the vehicle? To the seat belt. So where those seat belts attach to the frame, that is the proper location for your reaction loads uh, when you apply that load case. Uh, out on the wheels, if you're inverted, the wheels have no load on them, right? So that's a big mistake we see frequently. Uh, and it's actually uh, specified in the rules. So pay attention to that and apply both the analysis and the testing uh, and, and do that correctly. And compare your results. You can, you can look at the stress in your analysis you can model the deflection, and then when you go test it, then you can actually measure the deflection. So what happened? Now go back and compare the results. And don't give us a long several pages or eight or ten pages of finite element uh, graphics. Uh, show us what you did. Give us the results. A simple table. Here's how I compared the results. That gets points with us. DFMA. Uh, design for manufacturing assembly, very important. I would claim that uh, if you do not use DFMA, uh, and, and some teams will say, oh, we don't have time to apply DFMA. 
Uh, probably the time you will use in building your vehicle, if you don't apply DFMA, uh, you would have more than made up for by adding the extra time to address that. If you address design for manufacturing assembly from the get-go, it will help you throughout the entire process and you'll have cascading advantages if you do it successfully. Right, taking manufacturing time out of your process is very important. Uh, I think uh, Toronto told me that, uh, told us yesterday that they, they cut their fairing manufacturing time in half. And look, it's a, it's a beautiful design. Uh, so uh, so uh, you have limited time. Many of you are seniors. You're trying to wrap up your, your, your final uh, graduation requirements. Um, how can you do this smart? How can you manufacture your vehicle in the shortest amount of time? And incidentally, uh, if you come up with any new uh, DFMA innovations, they will be viewed very, uh, very well uh, by the judges. So uh, uh, DFMA innovations are, are important. Build mock-ups. Uh, build mock-ups. Uh, whether that mock-up be for fit for your riders, whether it be for fit for the ferry, uh, the, that can be very, mock-ups can be made uh, very quickly, very inexpensively. Use whatever materials you have on hand. Don't spend a lot of money get results quickly. Um, by building those mock-ups, you can determine the, the correct geometry for, your, for the fit and for, the, uh, for your riders. Uh, you can uh, size your fairing. We've already heard about that from Toronto. Uh, so uh, you can check for interference. You can check for visibility. You may need more than one mock-up to do those different tasks. That's OK. Go with quick build, easy, get your information, and use that in the design. And you can do that with a subassembly, just a very small subassembly. We saw some very good examples in the reports this year of just, I, I need to model this one uh, subsystem of the vehicle, knock it together, two by fours, uh, cheapest metal, scrap metal that you have. Um, you can learn a lot and save a lot of time in your finished design just by sorting out those, uh, those details. And build a prototype. And this is, is taking the next step, but uh, you might build a little system mock-ups. But actually build a, a quick build vehicle that you can go out and ride. So let the team members ride it. Does it handle the way uh, you hope it does? Can you ride it? Do you need to change the geometry for stability? Um, it doesn't have to be durable. It doesn't have to be necessarily high performance, but something you can get out and test and use as a test vehicle. Yeah, sorting out your steering, your stability, for example, making a, an adjustable fork that you can go out and try and road test and get different members of your team is just one example uh, that can make a huge difference uh, in, the, in the success of your vehicle. Stability. Uh, stability is always important to address. There are a, a number of resources out there. And stability can be addressed both for bicycles and for multi-track vehicles. And, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of this group thinks uh, about stability of bicycles, which can be a challenging problem, but we see an awful lot of rollovers with trikes as well. Um, so with, with bicycles, uh, the, the dynamics are quite complex and, and uh, fairly difficult, but there's some good resources out there. And uh, I think we've already had a mention of Bill Patterson's uh, Lords of the Chain Ring. Um, take a look at it if you have not. That can help you uh, dial in bicycle stability. Uh, build a, a bike that has variable geometry so you can change the, uh, the trail, for example. So you can change the uh, moment of inertia uh, based on the, the rider's position. And try it out. For multi-track vehicles, there's a pretty good uh, uh, information in the, in the literature on, uh, on stability and on handling. So I'd encourage you to take a, a look at, at, uh, in the literature. So can you ride your bike with no hands? I think that's the question. All right, I know a couple of you have said you could do that. That's, that's terrific. That's, that's the goal. Uh, I will say that stability also is, is uh, you don't necessarily want to design for maximum stability. You want to design for optimal stability. And those are not the same thing. So one of the, what, one of the objectives this year, you, those of you who read the rules noticed that we changed the requirements. It was, it, it was a, fine, uh, a fine adjustment, a nuance, but we're looking for self-sufficiency. We gave you a race 
with obstacles. That's, what, that's what's coming up tomorrow. We want you to build a self-sufficient vehicle that can go fast. Uh, I would say if you're not hitting 18, 20 miles an hour in your vehicle, it's too heavy, it's too big, you want to be able to get some speed out of it. So we want uh, a vehicle that can be operated without assistance. So thus, you, many of you had some very, uh, very nice uh, outriggers or you had ways to put your feet down. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a Le Mans start and an endurance race. We're going to have a stop sign on every lap. You hopefully all know that. Uh, that it was intended exactly to, pre to present this challenge. Drivetrains. You've already heard uh, from some of the talks before us about drivetrains and the importance of drivetrains. Uh, as you design your drivetrain, keep the chain line clear. You know, you can design a beautiful drivetrain and then somebody puts a, a frame member right through it. Uh, or maybe you just don't pay attention and you build a bike and, and you've got interference. All too easy to happen. Uh, that ever happened to anybody here? <laughs> I think there's more people uh, that uh, just uh, didn't want to raise their hands, probably everyone. Uh, so keep that chain line clear uh, and use a good gearing strategy. Uh, I, I have seen reports where teams designed gearing for the speeds they wanted to attain, regardless of whether there was any hope of them ever attaining that on level ground, uh, uh, simply from a power requirements. So look at what your team can, can do, look at where you want the vehicle to operate and what kind of terrain you want to operate and choose an appropriate uh, gearing strategy. And that includes both the range of gears and where that range is located. Uh, chain tensioning mechanisms. There's all kinds of ways to tension a chain. Uh, choose a good one and pay attention to proper chain tension. Uh, lots of options, uh, take a look at them. Listen to your drivetrain. If it talks to you, there's something wrong. You should have a quiet, drivetrain. If you heard some of the, the fastest vehicles today, or I should say if you were listening to the vehicles, some of uh, the fastest vehicles today, very quiet, very smooth as they went past. And lastly, keep your drivetrain simple. Uh, sometimes, uh, particularly on the, the recumbent vehicles, they can get very complex and, and convoluted. Try to keep them as simple as you can. Uh, Fairing, why do we require a fairing? Aerodynamics is a really valuable lesson that you learn in this competition. If you can get up to speed where 18, 20 miles an hour really starts to make a difference, you start pushing 80% uh, of the force that you're trying to overcome is wind drag. So having an effective fairing makes a significant difference. Even these little zipper fairings uh, can make a difference on, if, they're, if they're installed properly. Uh, so that's why we require this in this, uh, in this race. Uh, take a ride on your streamlined bicycle. This came across to me uh, the, the, the year that I competed. And we were riding along and we get up over 20 and um, regular bikes are pacing me and we just kept going and it was like they hit a wall. It's amazing if you can get up to those, speed, to those speeds. You also learn about materials and manufacturing process. And you see some fine examples of that here uh, in, in, in a, a really well-built streamliner. And I think we're going to have to go through our last few fairly quickly here. I think we're running out of time. But test, test, test. Test your work, uh, whether it's the design uh, testing, whether it's performance testing, particularly performance testing. Uh, you know, I have told students, when you get your vehicle together, go out and try to break it. Because you want to know where it's going to fail before you come to the competition. And you want to be able to redesign and fix it so it will not fail there. And there's some lots of creative ways to do that. A coast down test, a tough test. Uh, there's some, uh, there some uh, an, an oil process that I saw in one of the reports this year. Uh, there's some great ways to do it very inexpensively. Take good data and do the statistics. Include statistics in your experimental results. Uh, don't just uh, say we went out and tested and give us one number. At least give us a mean and a standard deviation. If you're comparing results, uh, maybe a hypothesis test is in order. Um, give us the appropriate statistical analysis of your data. That's the way engineers approach data. One data point is not particularly useful. And uh, again, striving for the best possible vehicle. I did have. Uh, a, uh, a, a, 
advisor, or actually not an advisor, a technician that worked with a team uh, at the petition here not too long ago. Uh, as we were changing the rules and, and uh, bringing in the, uh, the, uh, the utility endurance course, which now has been combined with the speed uh, course for this year, and they said, well, we don't want to race in a, in a race that could be won by an upright bicycle. And I didn't say this because I was polite, but my thought was, why? Are you not a good enough engineer that you can't build a, a bike that's, that can do that? Uh, we want you to, to build the, the best vehicle you can and to hold very high uh, standards of, of expectations for what you can do. Uh, we want you to build a bike that'll beat the upright bikes on their own territory. And I'm not knocking upright bikes, I ride one myself, but the idea that we're gonna limit ourselves is not one that we want to endorse in this competition. Fast and, and practical. So your report should be your very best professional work. Uh, it should be like your resume. You're thinking ahead to getting a job, uh, to jo a job seeking, interviewing. Uh, don't misspell words or misuse words. Um, I saw one, I'm not going to tell you who said it, but uh, talked about design mythology in, uh, in your report this year. Um, read it. Proofread it. Have somebody else read it. Do use your spell check. Um, and, and there are some good guidelines on, on the ASME website on how to write a report. Yep, and I don't know how many times I've seen uh, comments about BREAK testing. Uh, we heard from all three teams recruiting sponsors. Sponsors are available. Local businesses will help you if you go and ask. Think about what you need. Uh, in ancient times, uh, when I first competed in this, we had one person, she said, I will go do fundraising. And I thought, really? And we almost never saw her. But she would come back and say, you can go to the local Schwinn shop and they'll give you all the parts you need. She just paved the way. I really liked uh, the example of each team member has to go out and seek, uh, and seek funding. So funding is available if you just go and ask. And that's a good skill. That teaches you some, 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 uh, some sales skills. Okay? Okay. Very good. And so in conclusion, why do we do this competition? We want to give you some practical experience to help you get your first job. Yeah, there's some lofty goals in terms of saving uh, mankind and uh, saving oil and eliminating pollution, but what you really need is a job. Use this experience, uh, the, the experience of this competition to get a job, network, make professional connections, learn practical lessons. Lay that report in front of the person who's interviewing you. Bring some pictures along. That's how I got my first job, and it was a 25-year career with that company. And the, my boss told me uh, several years later, I said, why, why'd you hire me? And he goes, it was that human-powered vehicle thing. You, had, you came in, you had your confidence, you showed you had, had accomplished something, and I got a job in a, in a competitive job market. And that's what you want to use this career for, or, or this experience for. It's to launch you into your career. You've done some impressive work here, and that should, that should differentiate you in the job market.